Welcome back everybody to our course Introduction to Quantum Optics. In this lecture today we want to talk about an approximative way of solving the dynamical equations of motion that we derived for our state vector interacting with the light field. So we had the atom, we had the states in an atom, we turn on the light field and we want to see how that state vector evolves. So the equations we ended up in the last class were the following where we could relate the rate of change of being in the kth state to the amplitude of being in the nth state and a matrix element coupling the nth and the kth state induced by our light atom interaction Hamiltonian. And omega nk, that was just a difference energy between the nth state and the kth state in our system. So now let's try to solve this. In general this is kind of very difficult to solve these equations. If we would take all the states in an atom into account this would be a very, differ a very complicated differential equation set. And in order to simplify things a bit, uh, let's make some reasonable approximations. First of all, let's assume that at time t equals zero, the system is basically only in the ground state. So at time t equals zero, the probability of being in state one in the ground state is one, meaning that the state amplitude vector also has to be one. Now, Furthermore, we want to assume that we have a weak perturbation because of the light field. And that means basically that we're going to consider a case also where for all times that we have, the probability of being in an excited state k should remain low. Remember the probability of being in that kth state is given by the amplitude of the kth state vector norm squared and that should remain small compared to one for all times which means basically that only one of these coefficients is close to one and all the others are going to be close to zero for all times and the one that's close to one is actually this one for the ground state. So if only the ground state uh, is close to one then this sum actually dramatically simplifies. We can make an approximation that the strongest coupling to the kth state will originate from the ground state whose amplitude is unequal to zero and all the other states we can neglect the first approximation because their amplitude is going to be zero. So we just replace the sum for the term in the ground state, n equal one, and we obtain the following formula. And now this is of course simple to solve. We can basically just integrate this equation, just directly integrate this to obtain the kth state amplitude uh, at some time t. So we do that here and we see that the kth state amplitude is just given by this term here where this is our time dependent interaction Hamiltonian like the light field going on at some time, light field going off at a later point in time. So, so far this has been very general on what this interaction Hamiltonian actually is, what its time dependence is, so let's get a little bit more specific. So let's discuss actually the case of a sinusoidal perturbation. So this is exactly what we're going to encounter when the light field interacts with an atom. Remember the interaction Hamiltonian was d dot e where e is the electric field and if it's the oscillating electric field of light then it's going to oscillate at the frequency of light and so we're going to have some time dependence here e to the minus i omega t. And then there's some prefactor which describes all this de term in front, but the time dependence is just going to be given by this oscillating term. So that's a very general case and applies to the light field that we want to study here. So we consider the following situation that the light field uh, goes on at some time t equals zero, is kept at a constant intensity level and then the light field is turned off, the interaction Hamiltonian is turned off at some time t equals capital T. So what do we get? Well, we know we get from the last kind of pages, we know that the amplitude of being in the kth state is given by this integral. So now let's plug in directly what we have here for the sinusoidal perturbation. So now we see because this matrix element outside of this window is zero, I can just change the integration kind of um, limits to zero and capital T. And uh, what I'm also going to do, I'm going to pull together those two exponentials, but let me first write it out explicitly, minus i omega 1 k t k h i 1 e to the minus i omega t dt prime. 
And uh, so now let's pull the exponentials together and what we get is the following 1 over i h bar integral from 0 to capital T e to the minus i delta omega t prime k h i 1 dt prime. Where I've introduced the so-called detuning which is just the frequency mismatch between the light field frequency of our oscillating field omega and the resonance frequency of our atoms omega 1k. Okay. Well, actually I should write it for this to be positive I should write omega k1. So this is the so-called detuning that we're going to encounter a lot in our class. Sometimes we're also going to denote it by a small delta. And this detuning, actually, uh, we sometimes speak of it loosely as a system being red detuned when the frequency of the light field is smaller than the atomic transition frequency. And we speak of blue detuning when the light field is larger than the resonance frequency of an atom. Okay? So we could have a situation where, let's say, we have a light field which has a energy which is smaller or a light field which has an energy which is larger h bar omega which is larger than the resonance frequency omega k1 that we can have. So this would be red detuning and this would be the blue detuned situation. So now we can go straight forward ahead and calculate the probability of making a transition. So the probability after some time capital T after the light field has been turned on to be in the excited state k that's just given by norm of ck squared. Right? That's the probability of being in the kth state and I evaluate that at time capital T. And that's my what I call the transition probability at some time. So that's the transition probability. Okay, of making a transition from state 1 to state k. And you see it's determined by two terms. One is this uh, matrix element squared of the transition, again kind of being involved uh, in telling us how strong the coupling between state 1 and k is. We'll come back to that later. And this function y of delta omega of the detuning and our pulse length t. And uh, we see actually in the case that we have here, if you do the calculation, you'll find that this y is basically the sine squared of delta omega divided by delta omega squared. So if you think about it, this is pretty much a sinc function. Not exactly, but some prefactors, but it's pretty much proportional to a sinc function. And why is the sinc function appearing here? Well, it's not too surprising because think, if you think of it, we have this rectangular pulse and what we see, what this CK amplitude is, is basically a Fourier transform of our time-dependent perturbation. If we have a rectangular pulse, then the Fourier transform of a rectangle is a sinc function, right? So now what would happen, you can think for yourself, if instead of a sinc function, let's imagine that we would have actually a Gaussian here. If you would just have a Gaussian uh, interaction strength being turned on, what would you get for this y function? Well, you would just get a Gaussian because the Fourier transform of a Gaussian is a Gaussian. So in general you see this y function will be depending on how exactly our perturbation is turned on over time and turned off but in this specific case of just you know going bang on with the light field bang off with the light field this rectangular pulse we get this characteristic sinc function.